I just want to start like that, as that little brat. Um, uh, you can all fondly recall back to those days, I'm sure, um, when we weren't quite so as serious about life as we are now. And you may recall, like I do, being a little perplexed by what I call that miracle molecule. You know, the, the molecule you hardly ever heard of, yet makes up 75% of the universe, um, most of our planet. And it comes from water, and you can burn it. I was really worried about that one. How does anything burn from water? And then once you burn it, it goes back to water. And I was thinking, whoa, this can't be right. I went back to the chemistry books and thought, no, 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 this is all wrong. This is all wrong. But yes, it is that Harry Potter-esque um, magic potion, but in real life and real science. And I started a relationship with hydrogen from that point, and I've just loved it ever since. And about 11 years ago, I got the opportunity, this is after running down several rabbit holes, um, thinking how can, how can we come up with an energy solution which doesn't ruin our planet? Um, and I looked really, really hard at thorium. Um, those very early days of Fortescue, thorium, uh, we were studying from the perspective of could it replace uranium completely? The answer is yes. But it taught me a very serious economic lesson. Even though in the current process chains of making nuclear power out of uranium, and even as I've studied and worked on with Bill Gates for a considerable time out of uranium waste, which is the best of all options involving nuclear fuel, you can't quite escape the fact you get up towards weapons grade. And with thorium, there was no chance of that. No chance. But it was about 20% more expensive to produce electricity from than uranium. And the world just wouldn't cop that. And I couldn't get it. I mean, hang on. We've got a almost renewable energy, which will not make the world more dangerous, which will leave the world cleaner than what we have it now. Yet you won't cop 20%. And they didn't. And so I then turned that lesson into what is now, I feel, is a practical, impl implementable solution, which is and will be even more competitive economically, which can answer every single part of the industrial supply chain, which is 100% responsible for every carbon and methane emission and that's business. Yes. Was I a little tearful? It wasn't the dust in that huge, huge yard where we were commissioning for the first time the world's first green hydrogen powered haul truck. You know, those trucks with wheels almost as big as this room and could, wouldn't quite fit inside this entire room. Those trucks. And I challenged my young team of women and men, the, uh, the green team, part of the 15,000, 16,000 people we employ directly, but only 200 of them, to build a hydrogen fueled haul truck in three months and got met with the normal expletives I normally do from my family of colleagues. And um, I said, look, when you go close to failure, come back and talk about it. But this is the unreasonable target, which I have faith in you that you can achieve. And they said, boss, no one's ever invented a hydrogen fuel cell of anything like that capacity. Anyway, we've got to take out the drivetrain of a huge Caterpillar truck, replace it with an invention, wire it all in after manufacturing it and commission it in three months. I said, yep, that's what I want you to do. I went back a little after three months. Within that three month period though, not only had they commissioned the world's first hydrogen fuel cell haul truck, which under serious revs, better performed the fossil fuel haul truck we've known for generations, 
But its sound was the sound of the future. Silence. And its emissions was the sight of the future. Not what we're used to, exhaust and cloud and smoke, etc. But zero emissions except for what I wondered at as that little brat going to chemistry lessons and questioning the chemistry book and saying that can't be right. Just steam. And within that three month period, ladies and gentlemen, they'd also commissioned a locomotive engine. We at Fortescue have the largest, heaviest haul trains in the world. It's, I don't have to boast about it, it's in the Guinness Book of Records. And we took one of those trains away and we started to tinker with the fuel supply with 1% green ammonia and the rest diesel. And then two, and then three, and then four. And they kept tinkering with it over the same three month period. And it's now running at 78% green ammonia. In other words, there should be no train in the world which is not electrified. And don't think electrification's zero pollution. It's not, it's whatever's in the grid. And that's not zero pollution. But those trains which aren't connected to the grid are really seriously dirty. They pump huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And just in that three month period, now 78% can be completely abated. And at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, that got hold of a ship's engine repowered it, refigured it, and are now running it from the worst fuel we have on Earth, marine-grade oil. It makes our carbon emissions on land look sweet. It is so dirty. And they've got that up to 100%, 100% green ammonia. In other words, zero carbon emissions, zero sulfur into the ocean, zero other pollutants into the ocean, and no carbon nor methane into the sky. Three months, ladies and gentlemen, to prove the start of the next green industrial revolution. So I kind of believe there's been a lot of talk, as you know, politicians of every ilk have really, really had a fun time in the schoolyard arguing with each other should we go carbon neutral? Should we not? France is, Germany was slow. What America is doing, you know, Biden, whatever. But I've been to over 50 countries in the last 15 months. It was no joyride, it was no tourist run. I got COVID, spent several days in a respiratory unit in Switzerland. Not a joyful time but it backed up the previous four years which I'd had studying the fact that global warming is upon us, that there is going to be a point and scientists are busily trying to work out when that is, but the mathematical calculations are still too long, that we will tip from just a warming planet caused by us to a warming planet we cannot stop heating. It just continues heating and nothing but nothing we can do as the human race, as the Anthropocene, can ever stop it. That was in my PhD, ladies and gentlemen. And as you can see, I became pretty fired up over that. And I wanted to see if there was enough renewable energy in all the world wondering why the green industry revolution had not started, wondering, obviously, there wouldn't be enough renewable energy to power the world, which is why we're stuck with fossil fuels. Surely there wouldn't be a solution which was plain as the nose on your face. Surely not. I came back from these three trips, totally convinced there's several thousand times more renewable energy than the Anthropocene will ever use. Every day. Less than 300 square kilometres of solar with our current backward technology. 
could power the world from a desert in Australia. Power the world. So I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, our time has come. This is the power of now. This is the power of right now. If we know that there is nothing in the whole industrial ecosystem of our planet that cannot be replaced with green electrification, green ammonia, and green hydrogen, that we can make cement without carbon that we can make iron and steel without carbon, that we can make fertilisers without methane. And let's be careful about methane, ladies and gentlemen. Methane is gas, liquid natural gas. Emitted into the environment, it's 80 to 90 times more potent as a carbon warming agent, as a global warming agent than carbon. There's another potency described here, and that's the potency of lobbyists. Lobbyists persuaded the respectable organisation called the United Nations that methane wasn't a problem. They measured methane over its degradation period of at least 100 years, and it's not a problem. But on the way through the 20 or 30 year period, which is going to impact us most, where the tipping point, runaway global warming, could happen given 2050 successful. It is 80 to 90 times more dangerous. And so where I'm taking you, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have an absolute solution. We're proven it. Even the hardest to obey, steel, We've put a 2040 date for all our hundred odd customers around the world. And we didn't do this by saying, look, we're just gonna drop you like a hot cake. We might've had 30 years of relationship because you're pumping up carbon into the atmosphere. You're still burning coal, combining it with our iron. And this is serious, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, if you take myself and my other three iron ore compatriots, we and our customers produce more carbon than all of Russia all of Russia, just to make hydrogen grey. As you know, that 75 million tonnes pumps up 900 million tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere, more than all of Indonesia and Britain combined. So where I'm taking, ladies and gentlemen, is that we don't have to keep on doing this. That potency of lobbying is very short term. I'm saying to my friends, my colleagues in the fossil fuel sector, live out your life happily. Burn your fossil fuels, burn your oil, your coal, your gas, but don't try and hide it into hydrogen, where the fugitive emissions of methane alone are not measured. Carbon sequestration, my dear friend from Wally, Well, I don't know of a more failed industry than that one. I have agreed with very important people in the fossil fuel sector that I will stop saying carbon sequestration fails 19 out of 20 times. By agreement, we've agreed that I can say fails at least nine out of 10 times. I don't want your children or my children to rely on a failed technology and I certainly don't want that sector to hide its emissions and say, hey, we're producing clean hydrogen. Ladies and gentlemen, that oxymoron, a bit like the Postal Service or uh, let's go a little harder, cancer-free tobacco, clean coal. It's not green, it's not clean. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, you know that only a couple of hundred square kilometres will power the world of antique 
technology, which is changing so fast in front of our eyes, can power the world. Let's not any longer resist the change which is coming. For all of us in the business sector, the political sector, government service and civil service, let's grasp the future which awaits us, which is fully green. Let's say to the fossil fuel sector, wind down over time, don't hide it into hydrogen, and let's say to that whole fossil fuel sector, and use your technology, use your fantastic people, use your great balance sheet, and mostly use your markets, like two great fossil fuel companies I have committed to do, to go green. Then produce all the green hydrogen you can, because then we know for sure that we will not be making the nuclear mistake. And I don't mean just uh, a nuclear Armageddon, of course, I'm referring back to the fact that the market wouldn't wear for global safety that 20% gap. So I say, ladies and gentlemen, green hydrogen is here. We need to embrace it. It's a full solution. You drag a bit of nitrogen out of the air, instead of powering your cars, your planes, everything, you can power your ships, your locos, everything else with green hydrogen. What you can't power with that, you can easily power with green electrification. We have a solution to global warming, ladies and gentlemen. It's in our hands. I ask us all, and let's have Australia lead this, to take that opportunity. Because without it, let me just say, speak to your children. Thank you very much.